please welcome the panelists of the Health Transformation Panel, Trevor Fetter, CEO of Tenant Healthcare, Dr. Patrick Soon Shang, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Nano Health and Chan Soon Shang Family Foundation, Tim Fincham, Commissioner, PGA Tour, Sue Siegel, Chief Executive Officer, GE Ventures and Healthy Imagination, Bruce Broussard, President and Chief Executive Officer, Humana Inc., to join President Clinton on the stage. Those of you who have been at any of our previous conferences will recognize at least some of the people on the stage. And what I'd like to do is begin by giving everybody a couple of minutes just to talk about what they intend to do in the coming year, how they analyze this, and the point they want to make about the contributions they believe they can make to deal with this issue. So, want to start? I'd love to start. Well, thanks for having us. The, uh, we uh, have worked with the uh, Clinton Foundation over the last few years at Humana, and we're excited to say that we're going to commit this year to focusing on a community to help improve their health by 20% by 2020 by making, el making individuals easier to achieve their health. And I want to point out that the important part of that is not just the 20% improvement, but I think the healthcare system in general needs to focus on how we can help people achieve their health in an easier way. We as a, I think a society, health is hard. It's hard to stay healthy. I think it's easy to be, uh, have form bad habits. And when you look at the under-resourced areas, it's hard for them to maintain health. They don't have the uh, health literacy. They s sometimes don't have access to, to good foods. They don't have the economic um, conditions that, that promote health. And I think as an organization and as the healthcare system, partnering together with the organizations that are on this um, stage and, and throughout the industry is one of our obligations. So we look forward to working with you and improving the health in that community. Thank you. So my name is Sue Siegel, and I'm representing GE here. And what we'd like to do at GE this year is really utilize the employer bases as the catalyst for healthcare change. We, we represent health in a number of ways. One is one of the biggest medical device manufacturers, so we have a responsibility of technology. In addition to that, we have our health foundation, our, our, our um, GE foundation, and there we make grants as it relates to major issues surrounding health, as an example, the area of primary care shortage in this country and or underserved regions where we have put our clinical health um, clinics in some of those areas. And in addition to that, when you think about our own employer base, we have 500,000 covered lives, we have to really think about how do we manage the cost of health care while we continue to make sure that our employee health and the quality of their health are either the same or raised. And that's a major issue for us. We've been working for the, on that for quite some time. But the thing I'm most excited about is working about on our program called Healthy Cities with the Clinton Health Matters Initiative. We're working very closely with Ginny Ehrlich's team in Houston. And one of the reasons why this is so interesting is Houston, as you might think about it, is one of the, has some of the best medical centers in the US or in the world, and yet is one of the most challenged as it relates to stats and health stats. And we're looking forward to actually working on this together with Clinton Health Matters to actually make a difference. And my sense is that employers are real catalysts to allow this to happen. Employers foot about 50% of the healthcare bill in this country. We're a major customer to a lot of the folks on stage, as an example. And when customers in the room and are convening, it's amazing how people want to collaborate. So looking forward to talking about that. Thanks. I, I just have to say this. That Houston is about to face a new challenge, too, because there's so many low-income people there. And since the state of Texas has refused to accept the federal Medicaid money, but Houston's hospitals are going to lose their disproportionate share payments. They're going to be in a much more difficult situation than they were before. I know that 
some of the big urban hospitals in Houston and Dallas principally have actually asked the federal government if they could take their county out of Texas for purposes of <laughs> Medicaid treatment. I thought it was interesting because the governor of Texas used to talk about how he wanted to secede from the union, and since I was raised in Arkansas, I wanted to tell him not to let the doorknob hit him on the way out. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, now you've got some of these big urban hospitals wanting to secede from Texas to get back in the union so I can get this Medicaid coverage. But it, I, we're laughing, but it's an extremely serious issue if you're trying to manage a big health care system and you're going to all of a sudden see an increase in your uncompensated care bill when the program for uncompensated care has been eliminated because those people, it was assumed, would all have compensated care. And this is a, well, you can laugh, but I, I, it's uh, laughing I find sometimes clears the mind. This is a very serious issue. So, Tim. Uh, Mr. President, uh, let me just start by thanking you for all you've done for the game of golf. Uh, as uh, uh, I don't know if many are aware that the president uh, is chairman of the President's Cup. He's been to many, many Ryder Cups and President's Cups over the years. Uh, and I, uh, I remember a, a Ryder Cup over in the UK when he came and he watched the teams go off and after the last match there was a little rustling around the tee and uh, about five minutes later I looked down the fairway and in the middle of the first fairway at the Ryder Cup walking down listening to the applause of President Clinton who had stolen the show at the Ryder Cup it was fabulous. Uh, Last night there was a discussion about your athletic prowess and you talked about double digits in a basketball game. And I gotta tell you, Mr. President, I gotta believe you're a better golfer today than you are a basketball player. But <laughs> thank you for your commitment to us and your friendship for many years. We, uh, people wonder why we're involved in all this and uh, obviously the partnership between Humana and the Clinton Foundation with the tournament is very important to the PGA Tour and to our players. But from a health and wellness standpoint, uh, activity here it kind of fits with our culture. And let me explain that quickly. Uh, as most of you know, all of our tournaments raise money for charity. This year, they will raise over $130 million for charity. 80% of those charitable efforts at the tournaments are focused on some health-related activity. Uh, Arnold Palmer uh, Medical Center in Florida, the Eisenhower Medical Center here, St. Jude's Hospital, and increasingly wellness activity uh, as well. Among our players, the vast majority of the top 150 players have their own foundations, uh, their own fundraising activities. Last year they raised, among them, about $35 million dollars and at least three quarters to 80% of their activity is focused on uh, juniors, development, health, wellness, and the future. And, uh, and then our employees uh, who pushed back a little bit 22 years ago when we announced that there wouldn't be any smoking in our headquarters, um, today are part of a real focus on wellness, partnering with Humana, with their wellness, health, uh, wellness programs, over 90% of our employees every year are voluntarily scanned. That scanning has resulted in a wide range of activity changes and behavioral changes in our employee base, uh, and they are totally into it. So uh, initiatives and effort and energy behind things that relate to what the Health Matters Conference is all about and the Clinton Foundation is all about is just a natural for us. And, and, and given the fact that our players walk on average 30 miles a week, uh, they are gro uh, great role models on the fitness side of the equation. So uh, what are we doing? Well, I, I think as the president has often talked about on the on the the global scale of doing things like reducing uh, sugar content in diet and drinks available to sc uh, school children, that's a mega, colossal, global, countrywide effort uh, that needs to be married with lots of little activity at the local level. So for us, 
It's contributing to using our players as role models, telling the story of things like what comes out of this conference on a national basis. And at the same time, looking at the places we play tournaments, we're in so many markets, we have almost 100 tournaments, uh, about how we can uh, generate more activity there. And so this year, uh, we promised the president we would underwrite for the next five years as a part of the Players' Championship proceeds uh, the same thing that's going on in Houston, uh, and Ashley Smith Juarez, Ashley Juarez Smith, who is from Jacksonville and at a very young age has already become extremely prominent in the education side of the equation in Northeast Florida, has agreed to take on that role of, of coordinator, and we we will work and be behind her in supporting the effort of exchanging best practices, bringing governmental leaders together, and and making things happen. I think that uh, the other thing that I think longer term we can do is try to, you know, a lot of this discussion is all about defense and how much it's costing us and how it's going to bankrupt us if we don't do something and how it affects the educational system and how it increases the disparity between uh, income levels in our country. Uh, not enough, I, I think, is talked about in terms of the positive about what can happen, relating diet and wellness and physical fitness to success. And uh, I see increasingly young people getting that. Uh, but to me, uh, more focus on that uh, that we can help with, I think, is uh, a goal of ours as well, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I go on, I, I, Tim said something that made me think of something I should have said in my opening remarks, and that is, this is really about getting hundreds of millions of people to do specific small things one day after the next until you change the whole structure of the production, delivery, consumption of food, and the same thing about our exercise and activities, and then about the, obviously the changes that are going on in healthcare delivery. But I noticed the other day something I haven't heard anyone else mention, which is that with almost no fanfare, the food producers of America are selling slightly fewer calories per capita to people this year than they have been. And there was an article I read that said that, you know, if it's down like literally not an enormous amount, like 80 or 90 calories a day, but if you did 100 calories a day every day for a year, how much weight you would lose and how much we And so I think that all these things, there is a greater awareness. It's sort of in the zeitgeist here that everybody needs to step up and do something. And uh, so I thank you very much. And I never, I, I like to ride a golf cart, but Tim's basically shamed me into trying to walk him more on the golf course. You heard that 30 miles a week thing. So, Patrick. Mr. President, uh, thank you for the honor for inviting us here. I think um, I was just mentioning that the power of one man's ability to actually lead. Uh, President Clinton was responsible for getting, forming the funding for the human genome, responsible for funding the nanotechnology programs in that country, and responsible also for supporting technologies like NIST. So how does that relate to what we're doing? Out of, out of that came the human genome, and what we'll be presenting is the cancer genome. But we that would be presenting the work that we've developed, the first nanoparticle that's affected breast cancer, lung cancer, and pancreatic cancer. So our work, and we committed to the partner with the Clinton Foundation, is to try and address what I think is going to really be a major inflection of this country and the world, frankly, is cancer. And imagine if you could now, for the first time, measure cancer from the blood. Imagine, in fact, if you could um, identify what's exactly ailing and actually give the right treatment. I don't think we need to imagine that anymore. And we now have patients with pancreatic cancer free of met metastasis after having met metastatic disease five years out. We have now, and this is very personal to me, I have a cousin who came to me who in Canada was going to get the wrong treatment, said she had two months. She's now 13 months and almost free of disease. So I want that kind of information for the world to understand and to see and through this 
conference, uh, I'll be describing some of that work. The problem is, however, the science is so complicated, the information is so vast, how do we get this kind of information into the hands of a practicing physician? How do we get a physician in South Central LA, a physician in um, the Puma, in the Navajo Nation, or to have exact same treatment as if you were from Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson? And I'm proud to say that there's a collaborative that's being formed today where the best care of such kind of very high level sophisticated information can be populated. If Netflix can um, obsolete blockbuster, we can now change the way of actually getting information exchange across this country and we will through a integrated clinical operating system. So today we will announce a uh, operating system that's running 3.3 million cancer patients, been running for the last five years. And Bruce Bazard will take credit for that as, you, as part of US Oncology because we've launched that. And now in real time, patient will have actionable information in real time at point of care, in time of need, anywhere, anytime, and that's the goal. But it's more than the goal. We're actually launching that in this country. Thank you. Uh I love being around Patrick because I feel so dumb, and yet he makes me think that like a blind man, that, that, you know, there's a, I was raised in the South, and we had to say even a blind hog finds an acorn now and then. So he always makes me feel that I found an acorn by funding the human genome and the nanotechnology research, the first nanotechnology research we ever did. One of the few things Newt Gingrich and I agreed on, we put the first $500 million of your money into nanotechnology <laughs> research. But I, I think to bring this home, you should say just a couple of minutes here about the actual healthcare revolution you're trying to affect in South Central LA. Last time Patrick and I were together was in Los Angeles and he said, I am convinced that we can give poor people in South Central LA the same quality of health care you get in Beverly Hills. And, I, and uh, so it's a laudable goal, but how do you do it? So I, I, could you just give them a couple of minutes on what you're trying to do with that? Well, so the first thing is think about this. First of all, by the way, I came from South Africa, born in South Africa, lived in the area of apartheid. So I was the first white a, a Chinese person to be able to work in a white hospital. I had to take 50% salary to have the honor of actually working in that hospital. So I've come from, um, uh, I've been brought up in this area of oppression. I was astounded to find in here that a woman went to Martin Luther King Hospital in South Central LA, entered the emergency room, and called 911 from the floor of the emergency room asking for help to get her out of there. And she died on the floor of that emergency room. They shut the hospital down and said there will be now, the solution was have no care of South Central LA. So we were able to frankly, and I know David Feinberg is in the audience, to embarrass the University of California system to participate and help us open up South, uh, South you know, Martin Luther King. And it's now will be open, I'm glad to say, uh, in 2015. The issue, however, is not a physical building. The issue is access to information and access to best care, whether through telemedicine, but information and, and education, and bringing doctors to that community and that they could have information. A patient could in, in, in South Central LA through a software system that is ubiquitous, that transfers information about this patient's condition in real time to a specialist, let's say, sitting in, Bre in Beverly Hills or Brentwood or Westwood and have that information transmitted and communicated and that doctor being educated is going live. Uh, Dr. David Feinberg is in the audience. We're going to institute the first institute there called the Institute of Molecular Medicine where this kind of 21st century medicine is whether you're rich or poor, if you have cancer, this is what you deserve. And, I, and Martin Luther King, it's his birthday this week, said the um, uh, health care is a human right. So I think this is something we will be pursuing. And thank you, Mr. President, for, for that encouragement. But I think with a voice 
like the Clinton Foundation. We also have this, this system of electronic medical records, which, where the electronic rec records, unfortunately, do not speak. If you're in a hospital, there's no way for you transferring your information from one hospital to another. Yet there's a system that actually created ubiquitous information. We're about to launch this, as I said, in Tuba City in the Navajo Nation. So our idea is if you can address this in the poorest of the poor, um, we can make this work for the rest of the country. Trevor? Yes, th thank you again for this opportunity. I, uh, as my introductory comments, had the opportunity to say a little bit about what we do, but I'd like to tie together a couple of points that have been made in uh, elaborating a little bit on our uh, mission. So as I mentioned, we're in the uh, business of operating hospitals, and hospitals in our healthcare delivery system are really the front line in providing uh, care to people, particularly uh, when they need it urgently and in an emergency. And I also mentioned in, our, in my introduction that uh, our company alone is spending $800 million a year in uncompensated care. I, I was very uh, pleased, President Clinton, that you mentioned in your introductory comments that we've actually succeeded in bending the cost curve a bit uh, in this country. We're spending a little bit less as a percent of GDP now, and the rate of healthcare inflation, as you've pointed out, has reached historic low levels, probably lower than anybody in the audience can, can remember. So how are we doing this, and what is the role of, of the hospital? Because it is an essential role. Science is incredibly important, and the innovations Patrick was talking about will be transformational for health and well-being of, of the population. But in the end, you want that emergency room there, and you want it available at 2 o'clock in the morning to treat just about every, any condition uh, that you can, can think of. Uh, so our uh, interest, in addition to uh, wellness, which is obviously the topic today, is in providing greater value. The, our country spends more than enough money on health care, but the value isn't, isn't there. And I'm pleased that, and we can get into examples as we go along in the panel, that there are all sorts of innovations taking place that are enabling us to increase steadily the quality of care that we're providing, the reliability of care, the type of of reliability in emergency settings in rich or poor communities that would not ever allow the kind of uh, case that you mentioned uh, to occur, at least in one of our uh, hospitals. So I'm quite optimistic about the future for the health system, and I think particularly in this, this year of 2014 where we are embarking upon this grand experiment in, in health reform, you know, our hospitals are right at the epicenter, and Bruce's insurance plans as well, in trying to make this work and trying to pursue that laudable goal, which, which frankly was initiated by you during your administration, of trying to improve access to care and the uh, percentage of people who are covered by some form of, of insurance program, because we know ultimately that will lead to better health very, very uh, quickly. So I just would like to say, you know, hospitals are an incredibly important part of the equation, and I think we're actually doing a pretty good job. We're improving value. We have been successful in reducing uh, the rate of growth in costs. You know, we have a lot of demographic factors putting it higher. Uh, but I'm very proud of the business that we're in and the job that hospitals are doing as part of the healthcare system in America today. You know, all these people are really smart. I don't need to ask them probing questions. I'd prefer to let them talk, but I, I want to ask you to, I want to take the next step here. And if you're, uh, Tim's basically the only layman besides me who's here in that sense, but, I, okay, we're sort of stumbling in the right direction. Let's posit that. And science is out there, as Patrick says, but we have to figure out a way to make it accessible and usable to all of us. Given where we are, either in public health or in the healthcare system itself and the delivery system, as concisely as you can, what do you think the greatest challenges we still face are and what are the greatest opportunities, one or two of each, 
because I, I, I'll just give you an example. You mentioned that we needed to do more with primary care. Uh, there's a lot of worry that we don't have enough primary care physicians, nurses, uh, health care workers. I even saw a great article the other day in one of my blog sites about how we ought to really look at some of these developing countries that have done a great job with trained health care workers and send them to the most rural areas of the country and then hook them up by the Internet back to all of the stuff that Patrick wants to do. Uh, but I, let me just give you an example that I personally saw in the last six weeks. A friend of mine, I, I just went home to a funeral, and a friend of mine went to one of these clinics in a small and remote rural area instead of going into the nearest city to a hospital. And it appeared that it was a case of, uh, she just had the flu, but in fact she had sepsis, an infection in the blood. And by the time she got to the hospital, she only lasted three days. Now she was older and also very depleted in energy. So I'm not, I'm not, this is not a malpractice issue. This is a, if we're going to have distance healthcare, if we're going to have clinics, if we're going to have all this, do we have a system in America that will train people adequately to do it? That's the kind of thing I'm thinking about. So what do you think the greatest opportunities and the greatest challenges out there are? Okay, I'll start. <clears throat> I think it's, um, I'll put it in general, and it's reducing the barriers. I think there's a lot of barriers that we have, and I'll give you an example. A number of months ago, I was in South Florida, which is a large market for us, and I always find it uh, both motivating and educational to go visit some of our members. And I went and vis visited one of our members that was in um, South Florida, and it was in an under-resourced area. And I went in there, bars on the, on the, on the windows, and... Um, you know, a lady was in there, and I went with a nurse. With a nurse, I spent about an hour with her, and we went over her medicine. We went, we looked in the refrigerator to see what her nutrition was, and we do this at at Humana. This is part of our Humana Cares program, and she didn't know who I was. I just did this sort of a um, on my own, and when I walked out, President, there was a thing that she said that is probably will stay with <coughs> with me the rest of my life. She says I'm lonely. That was her comment. She was 80 years old. She lived alone. She, she was not. And I say there was a barrier in her life that she could not connect with society because of transportation, because of the resources she had. And loneliness for her was, was a health problem. Now, we don't diagnose that as a health problem. We diagnose a heart condition. We diagnose diabetes. We diagnose those, those activities. But when I walked out of that, that area, I said, get her transportation to a social community. And sure enough, we did, and, and, and that had an impact. And so when I think about barriers in healthcare, I think the things that Patrick's doing, as Patrick men mentioned, we, we partnered with, with the organization that he owns a number of years ago and created that. And I think technology is a very important aspect of the future. But when I think about the impact that small things that it's hard to do in healthcare, I think that's a great target for us. And I look at lifestyle, I look at social, and I look at economics as being an area that we as, an, as, a, as a healthcare system should focus on because I think that it will have a large impact on what we do. Yeah, what an inspiring story. Um, Can I do, well, but, but I just want to say one thing to support you. They, there have been a lot of studies and several books written about societies with high percentages of centenarians. And the island of Okinawa has the highest percentage, although it's kind of going down because it's being penetrated by fast food places. It's the only change that's happened. The um, more mountainous areas of Sardinia, not yet penetrated by fast food places. There's a spit of an, uh, an isthmus that comes out of Costa Rica with an Indian tribe. There are five or six areas. Without exception, one thing they all have in common is they don't let older people get lonely. 
And if their families die under them, that is, their children and grandchildren, they are given almost ceremonial status within their communities with roles to play and meaningful contacts on a consistent basis. So I just want to say there is like huge amounts of evidence to support what you said. Loneliness is a health matter. Go ahead. Just to, just to add just to that, but our system doesn't pay for it doesn't help bring it in. If you think about the impact that you just talked about. Well, it wouldn't be very expensive if we were organized exactly. for it the way these exactly. other societies do, the more simple and more rural areas. But go ahead. So there's many areas that we could talk about, but I'm going to build on what you were talking about, Bruce, and, and that is utilizing technology to start helping exactly what you talked about. And that is, for some reason, we have not allowed the likes of telemedicine or telehealth to become just part of our fabric as it relates to the healthcare system. It could tackle some of the loneliness issues that you're talking about. It could help the issue around being able to understand very, very quickly that it was much more serious than what she thought when in fact it became sepsis um, earlier on. And that is something that is, it's a technology, but it's also policy issues. It's the state allowing technologies to cross borders and being able to tackle that on a national basis is something that I think we absolutely have to do because that really will both decrease cost, increase health, address some of these issues around loneliness as you talk about, which I hadn't really thought about as a health um, determinant, if you'd like. And I, I fundamentally believe that that is something that we can do both on a national level but execute at the local level. Uh, let me ask you this, Patrick. Uh, following up on her comments, do you think all electronic medical records should be stored in the cloud and accessible, I gather, under certain circumstances? How are we going to do that, and are there national or local public policy issues that have to be addressed? That is, is there anything left that government could do to accelerate this process? So, Mr. President, let me address your question when you talk about the challenges and opportunities. And I've spent the last 10 years of my life, actually, uh, trying to figure this out. And I have had this very strange, wonderful uh, privilege of being in this country, coming from a socialized, so to speak, country in South Africa, where the doctor saw me at home with a bag in his hand. I came to this country, um, uh, invented, developed a Braxane in 1991, gave it to NCI. It's 2013. It's got approved for pancreatic cancer. So think about the time frame. So from the knowledge to the application. I then uh, ran with Bruce Broussard. We created this injectable company and I took over this injectable company in Chicago for the sole purpose to actually invent an nanoparticle. But when I took over this company as a surgeon, I recognized there were drugs that were not being made because there was no revenue for the drugs, heparin, this country, I was the only safe supply of heparin for the United States for 2008. So I understand the supply chain and what was happening with that. I then went, have come back full circle now and gone back to, into academia, so to speak. And this is how I see the challenge of the country. Nobody's looked at healthcare as a systems approach, where on the one hand you have the knowledge bucket, on the other hand you have the delivery system, and the third hand you have the payment system. The knowledge bucket is in today's world of genomics and proteomics, we cannot afford to wait 17 years for a molecule to get into the hands or even the insight to get into the hands of a person dying of cancer that has a year to live. On the delivery system, it's completely disorganized, disintegrated. There is no coordination of care. You cannot tell whether the patient's at home in the clinic or the hospital. On the payment system, and if the delivery system, however, uh, doctors want to actually provide care by keeping the patient out of the hospital in the home, they are actually disincentivized to do that. On the payment system, there's a, no ICD-9 code for health. There's ICD-9 codes for multiple procedures to churn, so you churn. So if you look at then the um, knowledge system and the delivery system and the payment system and said so you need to integrate that continuously and seamlessly and put it together as one unit, how do you do that? And that's what I've been doing for 10 years. Is then you needed to create a seamless, uh, overarching system 
that allows communications seamlessly to happen in real time. So when President Obama had this uh, four billion, this 800 billion and the four billion um, uh, um, in 2008, I had started this program in 2005. I met with him. Before Catherine Sebelius was hired, he says, you will meet with Catherine Sebelius. I said, Mr. President, please do not fund electronic medical record systems that will create what I call medical bridges to nowhere. And unfortunately, they've done exactly that because they've funded software systems that do not talk to each other. The business model is to be proprietary and not talk to each other. You've got to fund a middleware, a grid computed software system that the Large Hadron Collider is running on. The Large Hadron Collider and NASA is running on. I then convene with the Institute of Medicine. And he says, Kathleen met with me and she said, I'm going to introduce you to the, very, the national coordinator. I met with him. He says, I'm a public health guy. I don't know anything about IT. I said, fine, we'll give you cover. I'm in, we will have the Institute of Medicine. I, I convened a symposium for two days. Brought the best minds to it. They hadn't put out this award yet. And I said, fund for less than $100 million what's running the, the Large Hadron Collider. And we will be able to integrate the nation Unfortunately, it's gone completely the other way, and now um, the doctors are, are incentivized, the hospital incentivized with this meaningful use, which quite literally are process issues, they're not outcomes issues. So we went ahead and quietly then said, um, we need to do this. We, meaning my family foundation, and said it was a great country. I was able to sell both of these companies not because I built the companies to make money, but built the company to have a product which actually then became very valuable and decided we would take a billion dollars of that and actually fund internally the development of this. So what have we done? We've actually built an operating system that currently talks to any software, whether it be Epic, and it now is running four, three million cancer lives for the last three years across the, the pathway, across the delivery system, uh, and we know in real time. We've built in a software system that actually takes 10,000 cancer protocols and provides to the doctor in real time the knowledge of which cancer protocol to give to the patient in real time. It's now in 8,000 oncology practices. With regard to technology, it is the job actually for us is to actually make this healthcare system where he makes money where patients don't come into the hospital, where we actually have patients at home. I call this ICU at home, ICU at home, which <laughs> means <laughs> you need ICUs at home. And then this whole world of machine to machine technology is up upon us, it's right here. So I partner with Verizon and AT&T and I built an electronics company that could have boxes that could talk to each other, a blood pressure machine, a pulse oximeter, scale. Um, we have now adopted this, and now we went into every hospital that has 6,000 medical devices made from every different vendor, including GE. We went and wrote the APIs for 6,000 medical devices, went to the hospital connect box. We are now capturing three billion vital signs, real time, self-populating the electronic medical record. So if you've got an ICU in the hospital and you've got the same box in the home, which you've created called the health box, you can then create an ICU at home. We have patients, the patient that you spoke about, this elderly lady, you're absolutely right. We can actually put a pulse oximeter, a, a scale, and at home know that what's going on with her in real time. Um, and a, we've created a telemedicine device on the internet where you can actually have four or five-way video conferencing. So the systems, if you look at this from a systems perspective, if you can now con con manage a patient from the home, the clinic, hospital, and through a supercomputer do the genomic analysis in 47 seconds, which we've now accomplished. Uh, we've done 10,000, we're doing 1,000 genomes a month. You then have an engineered system for the nation, which then says, frankly, you have the ability to create what I call NORADs of healthcare. You then have the ability to create a building with three cardiologists, 20, uh, um, 10 oncologists, two pathologists, one pediatrician that can manage an entire city. 
But is it going? Is, is so is this going to happen anyway, or is there something we should change about the laws to make it happen faster? So what's preventing this is fee for service. So the issue is to actually create what I call outcomes-based, value-based care, and you create what I call change the payment system. So we created the CEO Council for Health and Innovation of the Bipartisan Policy Center, Muta Kent, Lowell McAdam, um, Bank of America, McKinsey, and the single largest barrier now is the disincentivizing care with fee-for-service, fee actually, ironically. So if you can then say, your job, Mr. Provider, is to keep this person healthy. We can measure the outcomes in real time. If you keep this patient healthy, this is your payment per month, and at the end of the year, if this patient's healthy, here's your bonus. And whether the patient's in the hospital, in fact, you don't want the patient in the hospital, but the patient's at home, and that's where we need to change the providers of this nation, and that's what we'll be announcing after this event, this cancer collaborative with the nations of the world. We have the unions also with us, and we have the United Food Workers Union is also participating here. They're in the audience here with us. This is what this nation is going to need, and this is what we, we think. There is the, the potential. is not the potential. We're actually doing it. The opportunity is not the opportunity. We're actually doing it. The obstacle is the, the payment system. Ironically, Medicare Advantage was the best system you had. And it's a system that's being penalized because they don't understand the actual system. Well, there are, it's interesting. We're doing more and more of this, paying to, to keep people healthy instead of paying to procedure. But there are, and there are incentives in this health care law to do it, but there's no mandated pace to get to everybody doing it. And I don't think it makes any sense to pay for anything else, really, unless you have some hugely expensive thing that can't be covered by the size of the pool people are in, involved in. There's no question it's, the, it's in, a, in a much more mundane world than the one you just painted for us, it also works. It works everywhere, not paying for procedure, but paying for people to be healthy. You agree with that? Yeah, I, I would agree. We, I think we are in a, so I'll just speak from a very practical point of view because you know, we are actually on the ground treating thousands of patients a day, millions of patients per year. The, we're, we're in a period of transition from the fee-for-service environment, which is absolutely pervasive throughout physicians' offices and imaging centers and kind of every healthcare um, node that you can think of in the system toward a system where there is accountable care and payment for uh, health. But it, it's going to take a very long time. I think we all need to be realistic about this. The conditions have to exist in a particular community in order to enable that. Now, we have some examples. Uh, in our own organization where this has been very effective. So uh, in Northern California, in a farming uh, and light industrial community in Modesto, California, we've actually been running an accountable care organization now for over two years. It's been very successful and has actually reduced the incidence of hospitalization uh, of the population there that has uh, participated in, in this uh, program. And actually, we've done just fine. Uh, as a hospital provider because, you know, we've been able to earn incentives, as you mentioned, through, um, you know, better health outcomes. So I, I think that that is a model for the future, but I, I think we all ought to be realistic about how long that'll take. Meanwhile, there are some great innovations taking place among the, the providers. I mean, you know, putting in place these advanced clinical systems to even capture the type of data that we're capturing, that just didn't even exist you know, six or seven years ago, you, uh, you mentioned government policy and incentives. The incentives for adopting these clinical systems have been very effective. Uh, in our own company's case, in total, we're spending about a billion dollars in advanced clinical systems, and the government incentives are making that it possible for us to do that by offsetting about half of that uh, cost. And although the interoperability and the sharing of data doesn't yet exist uh, freely. 
there are other great things that are happening. So we're, you know, uh, just in our company, we've avoided uh, hundreds of thousands, several hundreds of thousands of unnecessary tests. Unnecessary because they were duplicates. You know, we've all been in hospital environments when a physician walks in and is looking for a result of a test that he or she ordered and the result isn't there, so what do they do? They order another test. And uh, we're able to avoid that. We're able to avoid medication errors, maybe the wrong dose or even the wrong medication or at the wrong time being uh, given to patients. So these are really important innovations and improvements in safety and quality in hospitals that are being driven by this technology. Everything Patrick described is possible, and I think it will occur, but I think we need to give it a little time. Well, let me ask you this, but, and I know, I'm, I'll, and you can say whatever you're going to say, but I want to follow up on this. Your position is, I take it, that if we completely stopped paying for procedures and paid for performance for health care, that the government wouldn't have to do much more to end the the siloization, if you will, of electronic medical records, then there would be literally no incentive in the world uh, to not share medical records with, you know, appropriate privacy protection for the patients. But is that what you're saying? Correct. Correct. And, and, and that is exactly right. I think we have completely disincentivized the system um, and, and, and frankly, perversely incentivized it. I mean, you hear directly here, with all due respect, the, uh, the incentives of getting the money to actually put in systems that actually don't talk to another system is a perverse incentive uh, that the government's actually funded. So, I, I, and I think um, when we talk about uh, the time, I want to emphasize, not the time, that this is not some hypothetical. We actually are installed, as we sit and speak, as you said, in 50 practices, uh, 155 systems, 3.3 million lives, we're capturing 40 million claims a day, uh, 3 billion vital signs. It's being adopted by the NHS as we sit and speak. The software system that is intelligent is running 70% of the emergency rooms of Portugal. It's running uh, the largest hospital, Brighton, in the United Kingdom. It's running the largest cancer center in Brazil. So this is not some hypothetical. What it is is a will of us actually in integrating a platform that gives you actionable knowledge in real time, anywhere, anytime, and is evidence-based. But it also needs to incentivize the provider to give the best care. And um, the marketplace will do that if you actually provide, create providers and you will sift out. So you hear problems like accountable care organization, and I will challenge anybody is how can you have an accountable care organization when in no real time can you actually tell who's accountable for that patient? The IAM has shown that if you have surgery in your elderly, uh, comorbidity, you see just as one person, 27 healthcare providers. An elderly person in comorbidities has 19 medications. Who's accountable? So you can't have accountable care organization when you cannot measure who's accountable. And then you want to give this thing of value-based care. Value-based care is outcomes divided by cost. If you can't measure outcomes and pathways in real time, how could you know whether you're giving value-based care? And you have no idea about the cost in real time. So we have now built a system that can measure outcomes in real time and costs in real time. In St. John's Hospital, a patient walks into the hospital. The minute he walks into the hospital, we know exactly where he is, what doctor's touching him, what is costing him, what inventory is being used by the minute. So if you can measure outcomes in real time and costs in real time, you can give value-based care and you can actually create accountable care. But the accountability that it allows gives you the outcomes for um, health, and that's how they're actually going to be bonused. So that's a system <laughs> that I don't think is um, hypothetical. I think it's actually real. We just need the courage um, and organizations like yourselves to actually ma to be the voice. But uh, you, you're saying it could be done within the existing legal framework, or we need to at least change the payment system rules. It's, it, and the way I'm approaching it is I'm working then exactly as uh, Sue's talked about with the Fortune 500 companies and with the unions, and that's what we're announcing today, the BPC Council, the CEO Council, we will be taking the 
self-insured and in that context build a collaborative of providers across this nation, install this system, but on one condition, this collaborative will also work with the underinsured and the underserved. And now we will bring evidence-based 21st century care to cancer patients, whether in South Central LA or Beverly Hills, and these doctors will be able to do what they do best, i.e. provide best care. Okay, let me just say. And in theory, we should be able to bring it to any country in the world, right? Correct. If we have, one of the things that our foundation's involved in is this remarkable effort to, the Rwandan government has asked us to undertake. They are still a low-income country. They want to be free of all foreign assistance in their health care program by 2020. So they, we've worked with them for years, and Dr. Paul Farmer at Partners in Health, to design a program they can afford to run that will provide high outcomes for them. And it's basically, you know, build a good hospital in every region of the country, which we have now completed doing. Have one good cancer center in the country, which we've now completed doing. Um, a lot of people think poor people don't get cancer. They're actually, the rates are fairly consistent across the world. And then do a network of clinics and then train community health workers, which is why I had this nightmare experience I mentioned to you because it's, it's really the same in America, you know. But if you have the technology, it, it should work. I mean, with, we've got 19 American medical institutions working there training these people for 7% overhead. I'm very proud of that. Lowest in history. And they're going to be free of, I think, all foreign assistance but they will only have really good care if they are hooked into a global information network that will enable people. The thing that kills me, like in Ethiopia where we work, there were only 700 clinics in the 60,000 plus villages of fewer than 1,000 people. So there are all these people in the world that you don't think about that are still dying anonymously. Nobody ever knows they live, nobody ever knows they die. That is nobody who keeps such records. And so I, I'm very interested for the rest of my life, the stuff I don't do here, about how to apply these technological p possibilities to places like, like in, uh, Patrick's from Port Elizabeth, right? In yeah. Af South Africa? They said, you get sick in South African cities, you'll be fine. But out in the bush, there's still people who are dying alone. So I'm working with uh, Haile Debas at the UC Global Health Initiative in Ethiopia, and we're doing some of this kind of things for, for, yeah. for Africa. But it's true. If we can, so that's the point I'm trying to make is if we did this in America, it would have an incredible ripple effect across the world by just building the infrastructure to people access. What were you going to say? I was just going to build on Pat's aspect, um, bringing it a little bit back to the States. Uh, the you know, 70% of our, our revenue is Medicare Advantage. And it has just transformed the organization over the last number of years from, because of guaranteed issuance, we have to take everybody. Is we're not an insurance company, we're a clinical company. Because we are highly incentivized to keep people healthy. I mentioned to you about the individual I, I um, visited in South Florida. The reason why we have nurses going to their home, checking if they have ramps, or checking if they have nutrition, ensuring they're not depressed, is because we're responsible for their health. We are paid an overall fee for their health, and they stay with us for seven to 10 years. And so getting back to Patrick, I think it's the integration of the technology with a reimbursement system that motivates people to take responsibility for people's health, not just the information side of that. And to me, what it's done for our organization is transformed our organization to be innovative about being responsible for people's health. And I think if you change the reimbursement system, you will bring that innovation as what you were saying before. I, I want to comment just really quickly on one thing, and that is in rest of world. In fact, some of the things you're talking about, Patrick, and in terms of some of the African nations could in fact happen faster because they don't have a legacy system <laughs> like we have. We don't, they don't have to defend the fee-for-service system as we have here. 
a lot is self-pay. In fact, the percentage of self-pay, um, that, that's what governs uh, so much of the healthcare system over there. So in fact, pilots that we're trying to do at GE surround around some of these activities that you're talking about. We should be able to do those fairly quickly in, in some fact, of these developing in fact, countries. you are. You had, I was also working with Mohammed Yunus in Bangladesh, and GE's there with the ultrasound and the handheld ultrasound. They have leapfrogged. Uh, Bangladesh is refocused because they don't have landlines, they have cell phones. And, uh, and let me just comment on that, because it's actually, for me, it was pretty inspiring when I learned about this and what, uh, what um, GE was doing, and that is, we have a handheld ultrasound. And you guys, for those of you who've experienced ultrasound, you have to go into the hospital or you have to go into an, a, a system, and you essentially, you know, you have to book an appointment. There's a, a, there's a lot of things about the system that just is. GE came out with this handheld ultrasound and now has it connected. And so now you can just imagine as it relates to prenatal care and as it relates to decreasing the morbidity of, of, of infant death, it's a remarkable tool. And we're doing that in a lot of um, developing countries to be able to help this because in remote villages, they all have phones and they're all connected but they don't have the tools. And we feel like this is something you can train people to utilize very, very easily. So as it relates to possibilities of bringing technology into these developing countries, getting the connected world, actually utilizing these in these remote, remote villages, it's happening today. I have to agree with you with that. Here, we have the legacy systems. We have to break through. and I. I know you say it's happening already, but I, I have to agree with you. It's going to take a little bit of time because the policies don't allow us to do what we'd like to do state by state. We're still breaking down those sort of barriers that we have to do, unless you fund it yourself. No, <laughs> so the way we're addressing this prison is we're going state by state. So I'm working with the governors. So we're going through this, unfortunately, state by state. <laughs> but that's how but I, 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 let me just, make, to make sure everybody understands, we had a little bit of a, we got off in a little techno speak here. The reason that Medicare Advantage works in the way they're talking about is that it was conceived as a way of paying people to take care of people on Medicare and to get a premium for doing prevention, for keeping them well. So the idea was there's a fixed price list here that's the Medicare payment that, let's say, I would get at my age for me. I'm enrolled in Medicare, and uh, if I sign up with you, you were going to get this to fix me when I'm sick. So we'll give you this to keep me well. In the beginning, there was a lot of controversy about it because in the Congress, there was almost 100% agreement that there should be more preventive care, but there was the suspicion that it was being done to privatize Medicare in a way that would allow the whole program ultimately to be drastically underfunded. But it was uh, because immediately people began to see the benefits of the preventive work and keeping people healthy, it was obvious that it was costing the providers about $600, I'm making this up, but this is pretty close, about $600 a patient a year to do this, and they were getting reimbursed at 1100 and nearly anybody do anything for an 85% markup that wasn't illegal, it wouldn't send you to jail. So over time, the providers got better and better and better at keeping people well, so the reimbursement rate could get both lower and closer to the cost of providing the preventive services, eventually you're going to go into negative territory because you're not going to have people using the Medicare on a per capita basis you had accepted. That's why, in a funny way, what started off as this big ideological fight and a big leap of faith has led to a broad, uh, widespread acceptance of funding prevention and paying people for wellness instead of paying by procedure, which we're, we're out of time, and I, I want to get by that. This brings me back to the conversation I had with Tim Fincham when he asked me to try to co-sponsor this 
Bob Hope Golf Tournament, and we got Humana involved, and I said, I will do this if you let us have a conference at the beginning on health care because one of the things that I had to face up to when I had my heart bypass surgery is I love getting my heart fixed at Columbia Presbyterian. They saved my life. It was fabulous. Then they had to go fix me again. But I, Americans cannot see themselves as helpless, passive creatures on a conveyor belt. Waiting, and so, because I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, my God, if I get cancer, I want this guy to <laughs> do my genome in a hurry and find the one miracle cure out of five billion options that will make me 20 again and healthy. We're all laughing, but I'm pretty close, aren't I? Okay. Okay, I got it. I want that too. But the job that Tim and I have, and the rest of us, and even the providers are telling you that that's what they want now, is we are not helpless, inanimate blobs on a conveyor belt. We also have, our responsibility in this whole deal is to minimize the number of times they'll have to help us. And so... So that's why I, uh, I'll go back to the PGA. When he agreed to do this, there were an unusual number of golfers and their families who had devoted their foundations to health care, right? But normally, for perfectly understandable and wonderful reasons, they were trying to help solve a particular problem that someone in their family had experienced. So uh, you look, Fincham is a day or two older than I am, I think, or a day or two younger, but he, look how healthy he is. He has not lived his life as a conveyor belt. And I think, so I, I just want to point that out. I'm, I, I, the PGA took a big risk in doing this. They were trying to save this tournament. We were trying to preserve the legacy of Bob Hope and having uh, we raise a lot of money here every year that goes into health institutions in the Coachella Valley, as well as all this stuff. But I think the main thing that golfers can do with what Tim said about walking 30 hours a week is we can, we've got to all contribute to this idea that you can't ask all the rest of these people to just take care of us. We have, we have a heavy responsibility here personally and in our families and in our communities take better care of ourselves. So I want to thank Tim Fincham for doing his part to send the get off the conveyor belt message to America. Anybody want to say anything else? I just want to say thank you, President, for all you're doing. Thank you. Bless you. Let's give them a hand. They were great. <laughs>